G'day everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max and today I'm joined by Flynn and one of our returning guests, Connor Atkins. So good to see you again, Connor. How have you been? I've been good. It's good to be here. Excellent. So a few weeks ago, we had an episode on the Apple M chip vulnerability, which was a, well, there's a bit of confusion now about whether it's unpatchable, whether it's not. There's um, some new information that's come out. And Connor, we understand that you're uh, pretty passionate about this and you have some experience as well with um, with this kind of issue. So do you want to just give us a kind of brief rundown, so just so our viewers remember, of what the initial vulnerability was? Yeah, so the simple breakdown of the vulnerability is it's similar to, well, it's a caching, a caching vulnerability caching side channel attack using the speculative caching. So the CPUs, they can use the cache to make things access faster, but they need to put stuff into the cache. And the simple way is that when you access something multiple times, it will cache it. But if you want to access something once, you might also want to cache it. So the CPU does uh, branch prediction. So if you have like an if statement in your code, like an if password is true or if password is false, Uh, you have those two branches and the computer doesn't know which branch it's going to take yet so it can guess both branches and then look ahead at the code and see if it did that branch what would it need to take from memory and then it can cache that so speculative caching is just looking at potential paths and then caching those variables before you get to them because it makes the CPUs much faster and it's used in every CPU basically and it led to some attacks like Spectre and Meltdown a few years ago in the AMD and the Intel CPUs, which was exploiting the fact that it would go ahead in the code and then take stuff from memory. Now, this M1 or M2, all the all the M chips have this. They have a new vulnerability. It's similar to Spectre and Meltdown, and it is because of Apple's special cache speculative caching system called DMP. Um, I forgot the acronym. It's up here somewhere. Data memory dependent prefetches. So it's speculative caching. It looks ahead at the code, looks ahead at branches, and then it speculatively caches stuff that the code might use. But it does one little thing extra. It goes one step further. It also looks at the value from memory that it's put into the cache. It inspects the actual value and looks to see if that value looks like a pointer. So this looks like a pointer is the problem because it's actually inspecting the value. And if it does look like a pointer, it then goes and caches that memory address. So my cache case, the first cache is grabbing from the memory at some variable in the code. And then it looks at that bit of data Mm-hmm. And then if that looks like another pointer, it will go to that bit of memory and then cache that bit as well. And the problem is you can do a side channel attack on this, which is basically just a fancy way of saying someone else can look at the cache and all these operations coming in and out. And if another bit of code, like say your operating system decrypting your hard drive using a secure technically uh, secure algorithm like RSA encryption yep. it can see through the side channel that the cache is doing something and then it can infer some information about the system and it can potentially extract RSA keys like in this case that's what has been proven to be done right so based off that so we, we were much less technical when we covered it what do you think we actually got wrong? So I think the main thing we got wrong is this. We said it was unpatchable. Uh, at the time, that's what we believed was the case. But in terms of maybe we got it wrong originally, had there been any updates, what's the current situation on how Apple can actually tackle this? Yeah, so the idea that it's unpatchable comes from it being baked into the hardware. So if you want to stop this speculative caching, this DMP mechanism, you can't. The CPU does it every time and you can't stop it in theory yep. and in that case in that sense it's unpatchable but there was some ways to patch it well, work around it would be the better way 
Uh, one example would be using a different CPU core known as the efficiency cores. So the M1, M2, all these M chips, they have performance cores and efficiency cores. The performance cores, they do this DMP speculative caching and the efficiency cores don't do it as much. So you can use the efficiency cores for these secure operations and it will slow it down, but it won't be vulnerable to this side channel attack. Right. But it would be a massive slowdown. There's also one extra thing, which is why the newer M chips, I think M3, um, is not as vulnerable to this, is because you can actually specify for a specific operation to not use this speculative caching, this DMP. So you can just set this bit when you're doing these encryption mechanisms, and then it won't do that DMP, it will be safe, and then you can re-enable it so that all your other applications like video encoding and many other applications would be fast. So in that sense, you can sort of work around it so it's not fully unpatchable. Uh, the worst case scenario would be that it was completely unfixable, you cannot walk around it, and maybe the attack was easier to do. In this case, you need you need software running on your machine that has, um, like someone needs to get malicious code running on your machine, and then they can listen to other operations using the site channel, and then over time infer information. And it's not a very strong attack. It's not like someone can immediately take over your machine. And if it was something like that and you couldn't work around it, then it would be unpatchable and you'd have to replace the hardware, which would be yeah. extremely expensive. But yeah. that's not yeah, that the makes, case. Here. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I actually was a little confused myself because I was seeing this and I was seeing, obviously, there was a bit of uh, overreaction, I suppose, from the community, which I must have fed into myself. But I was kind of like, this seems like a bigger issue. And, um, you know, the idea that it was unpatchable and... um the the exploit didn't seem as crazy as some people were saying but it makes sense that it's not as i suppose severe as a vulnerability as we may have thought originally just another question connor so how do you see them fixing this do you see them maybe uh changing the way that the the um computation the 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 d and what was it again the dmp or the d dmps yeah yeah, so changing how those sort of uh, work with all the pointers and everything, or is, you know, how would you recommend a fix to this? What do you see them doing? So, yeah, so in the M3 in, in chips the new, and yeah, so on, the new iteration, they yeah, have yeah. the ability to disable it. Um, and obviously, in the new ones, they might patch this or make some extra thing that keeps these cryptographic functions fast without having this leakage. Yeah. Uh, in the old chips, they apparently don't have this ability. And then the workaround for efficiency cores makes it very slow, especially if you have to encrypt everything that you're doing. It takes a long time if it's efficiency cores. There was an update from um, someone called Hector Martin, and they apparently found on the M1 and M2 chips that there was a chicken bit, which you can set, and it will disable DMP uh, okay. on the performance cores. Uh, but apparently that can't be used so it's to do with the kernel so the kernel can set this but the mac os cannot set this directly so i don't know if they can patch the mac os or if it's baked into the kernel sorry connor did you say a chicken bit yeah it's a chicken bit i uh i looked up why it's called that and it's great it's because well apple in this case they added this speculative caching doing this fancy dmp stuff mm -hmm. and it's faster so they should include it all the time but it might do bad stuff it might be a bit weird so they add a chicken bit so that they can chicken out of using it in the future because okay. otherwise it would be an unpatchable vulnerability um right. so they might be able to use that they might not people on linux using m1 chips can probably use that um, people hacking into their systems can maybe use that to fix this uh, but in the future they will just have this bit so that they can disable it uh, in the code, the, on the um, operating system. Wow, that was great, Connor. Maybe a little bit sort of confusing. I just have another question. So how, how does sorry how does DM the DMP work with that? So there's branches that are um, 
sort of select uh, selected to be preloaded into the CPU or pre-processed in a, in a, in a sense, and then uh, DMP makes that selection, does it? Okay. So, so the CPUs they do instructions mm -hmm. um, mostly in order, not always. Yeah, uh, they have a many many optimizations for CPU architectures. We've, we've kind of hit a limit with clock speed, so now we have to go wider. Um, and there's also complexities there. But the idea is you have this code, which is a set of instructions, and at some point you might have a jump if equal mm. or an if statement. Okay. Yeah. But you haven't evaluated the if statement. Maybe you're waiting on a computation that will take a few milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And the CPU is the CPU is doing that computation in a little part of it and it's waiting in the other part. So it's not using its full capability. Yeah. So you can pretend that it will be come back as true or that it will come back as false. And you can start to execute those different branches. So that's branch um, speculation, something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the technical term is. But you have those branches and it can start to speculatively do stuff. And one thing that it can do is cache. So it can look at those branches, look at any data that it might pull from memory. So it might use a memory address for a variable and it will speculatively go to that or it will actually go to that memory address mm -hmm. and then pull that variable data and put it in the cache so that in the future when the CPU executes that that if statement goes to the branch mm -hmm. and then uses that variable it will find it in the cache and that will be faster right okay. so it's using that downtime while part of its thinking and the other part is not being used to do the speculative caching. And, and and the vulnerability is that you can listen into that caching and um and decrypt it. Yeah, so the DMP goes one step further and looks at the cache and will find values that look like pointers and then go and speculatively or go and cache those values, those address locations. Yeah. So the first one is a variable in the code gets used and then we cache that before we use it. But then we also look at it and if that looks like a pointer to another value, then we go to that value, pull it in and cache that. And so that's the main process and it works because it's very fast. Mm -hmm. um, if it was a pointer and you were going to use it, you have it in the cache now, it's very fast. Yep. The problem is that you can do a side channel where you have your encryption algorithm, maybe you're decrypting your disk, and it's running in one process on the CPU, on the cluster. Mm. And then you have another process, which is malicious, and they're both on the same CPU cluster. They could be running at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, they will be, but they'll be taking turns. And they use the same cache. And they both have access to the cache. The cache is like public knowledge, basically, yeah. in a CPU um, for everything else that's running on the system. And so you can inspect the cache, which is very, I don't know how to do it, but <laughs> researchers are able to do it. Uh, you can inspect the cache and you can find what things are in the cache uh, because you have access to it. If you tried to look up a value, mm. which you wouldn't be allowed to if it was owned by another operation, uh, another process, but you could, in theory, use the cache. Right, okay. And from that, you can craft an input to that encryption algorithm. So you have your known input attack, mm -hmm. your known input to this encryption algorithm, and then the unknown secret key. Yep. And they get combined together into the algorithm, for example, Diffie-Hellman or RSA. Yep. And we know these algorithms, we know what they do. Uh, and then you can watch that happen and look at the cache. And you can see that a value gets put into the cache. That makes sense because it's looking at one of the branches and it's grabbing that value. That value might be some combination of your input and the secret key. Yep. So you combine your input and the secret key with some operation to get an output. And that output gets put into the cache. But then it looks at that output to see if it looks like a pointer. Mm. And then we'll grab that location and put it into the cache. And you don't need to like 
fill your memory with a bunch of values that you can then read if the cache goes to that location and look at that. You probably can't do that because it's probably protected. Yeah. But you can see that it did go to a value and put it in the cache. So if you craft your input in such a way that if, say, the first bit of the secret key is a 1, and if it's a 0, it will be different. So if it's a 1, it will look like a pointer, and it will go and do the second caching. And if it is a 0, it will not do the second caching. Mm. You can do that, and then you've got the first bit of the RSA secret key. Right. And you can just repeat that many, 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 many times. Yep. And uh, these, these attacks take like a couple hours. Yeah. Um, you can eventually leak the whole secret key. So there's a table that the researchers released and for an RSA 2048 key, you can leak that in about 40 minutes. Yeah. A bit, 50 minutes or so. So about one hour of just having this malicious code running on your computer, listening to the cache and feeding some inputs. Yeah. You can get the RSA secret key. Yeah, wow. And if you help it's about uh, just over two hours. Right. And then you can breed whatever you want in the cache. Yeah. If that's your if that's your RSA key for encrypting your hard drive, then hard you can drive. just Every steal the laptop and now you have the whole hard drive without the password. Wow. Yep. That's insane. So <laughs> that's kind of where I think the whole, you know, freak out sort of came out, came with was, okay, if this is successfully done, yeah, someone could steal your laptop, steal your work laptop if you're using a uh, new like Mac and then, um, yeah, take, <laughs> you know, just run the whole hard drive, decrypt it without even, you know, using the password. Which is, uh, you know, that's a that would be a big issue <laughs> for a lot of companies. Yeah, definitely. So, Connor, you mentioned that uh, the time it takes to break certain cryptography within the M chips vulnerability. I've seen that you've covered a lot of this stuff in previous blog posts in the past, quite some time ago. I think it's around twenty twenty. Um, did you want to just talk a little bit about that? Yes, there's a very interesting reason why we use. So many bits, obviously, in, for example, RSA, Diffie-Hellman, if you have larger primes, like, for example, we normally use 2,000-bit primes, um, they are more secure, but they're a bit slower to compute, and finding the primes is harder, which is a really important point. And we could use smaller primes, like 512 bits, and technically, the search space for brute forcing these secret keys is very big and it's pretty secure in that case but no one uses it because it's not actually very secure mm. and it's interesting how you can work that out so if you have a diffie hellman 512 bit prime um it's quite small actually it's it's, it's massive <laughs> but relatively it's quite small compared to the other ones that we use and you do your diffie hellman key exchange you get your secret keys and these don't live very long. Like if you do Diffie Hellman with a website, it will live for your session and then you might use a new one in the future. Or they might live for a few weeks or months, but they don't like RSA keys that can live for a lifetime. Um, these are very temporary, so you'd have to brute force it within that matter of days or, or weeks. And if you have this uh, 512-bit prime, you can't brute force it, mm -hmm. but you can assume that someone is going to use a specific prime, you pick a prime number, and then you form a pre-computation attack. So you just brute force it, um, brute force it now, and then in the future, once you find the answer, you can use it. So you can make a essentially a lookup table where you have for a single prime, not all the primes, so it doesn't completely break it, but for a single prime, and researchers did this they had a really really big computer but this was academia so it wasn't that big but it was quite big and they were able to uh, i think in a couple months or maybe about actually it was about a week mm. so after about a week of computing on this big supercomputer they were able to make a lookup table for a certain prime 512 bit diffie hellman prime and then they could sniff someone's diffie hellman key exchange and they could work out what the what the A and B were, if you know how diffie hellman works. Basically, each side takes a random number, and they put them together, and you can't 
work out what they were, but you can listen to both parts being put together. Mm. But from an outside observer, you can't work out what they were. Yep. Um, they could basically use this lookup table to work out what the secrets were. Right. They did all the pre-computation beforehand, and then it took a couple of minutes to just look up this really massive lookup table. Wow. Um, what are some of the implementations or the implications of, uh, of cracking that, do you think, Connor? Yeah, a bunch of stuff uses it for key exchanges that need to be two-way. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, two-way communications use Diffie-Hellman. Right. And it's great because it means that you can make a new key every time. Mm. So, Connor, do you have any closing statements or anything about encryption or Apple's M-chips or anything you want to bring up and um, touch on? Well, when it comes to Diffie-Hellman, if you're not using the, if we in the future invent a quantum secure one, if you're not using that one, then if you're using the traditional Diffie-Hellman old school, then make sure you use a lot more than 1,000 bits because the NSA has probably broken all the 1,000 bit primes by now. Not all of them, but all the ones that people use. So yeah. just stick to Diffie-Hellman 2,000 bit for now until we get quantum computers, then you might be in, in some danger. I think once M-chips. we're at that point, we're we're in trouble anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And for the M chips, uh, yeah, the M chips are really good, but with this great speed comes potential for security flaws like this. Do you think that people that have a Mac computer should they be worried? Just don't install malware. Um, and if you <laughs> when you when you inevitably install malware, um. Yeah, good luck. (laughs) All right, got it. Thanks so much, Colin. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.